good morning and welcome to Joy on this beautiful August Sunday. So happy that you've joined us for this live service. Uh, whether you're a regular Joy member or you're a family or a friend or a guest of uh, a member here, I'm happy that you're here with us this morning and hope that you leave feeling the love of God. So I ask you now to just get yourself comfortable in any way you see fit and please join us in our opening praise. Yeah. 
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God, When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God, Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me 
down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99, and I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away, oh the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God, yeah. Before we pray, I just want to mention that today we're starting a new sermon series called Waiting for the World to Change. And today's focus is on knowing God. I thought about what an amazing and poignant series to be starting in this year of 2020, because I think right now everyone is waiting on the world to change. And changing could mean so many things to someone. It could be changing from all the unknown still due to COVID to just something different. It could be changing the injustices that we continue to see. It could be changing our views and beliefs socially or politically. When I mention these things, though, because what my hope and prayer is, is that through the last five plus months, that the one thing that hasn't changed for anyone, part of our joy community, is how you've known God. I want to hope that as you've adapted to new norms, that it has brought you closer to God in your own way. And I want to believe that as you've struggled that we, you have thrived in your faith and your belief that God is still watching over you and the ones that you love. Now, I'm not going to lie. Being in this place today live with the people that I have come to love over the years is an awesome feeling. And while we can't hug or shake hands, just being in the mere presence for me keeps me moving forward and hoping for a continued and better things to come. So now I'm going to pray, but I'm going to do things a little bit different today. I'm going to pray through a poem that I found by Ken Pilcher called Faith is Easy. And I want you to just listen to these words. Will you please pray with me? Faith is easy when you know that Jesus loves you. Doubt and fears, worry and anxieties should have no hold on you when you trust in the love of the Lord. Then never doubt his love for you, for he loved even those who hated him. He died even for those that crucified him. He did not spare his own life, but gave up his life for you, for everyone. Then how would he not give everything that is needed to those that love him, to those that put their trust in him? When doubts and fears arise, remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Trust in his love. Have faith that he will give you all things. Why? That is easy. Because he loves you. Morning, Joy. Welcome to worship, and I want to extend a great big worship, especially to those, a great big welcome, especially to those who are, are watching us on live stream, maybe for the first time. Uh, we hope that today our mission statement lives into your life in some way. Uh, we say this thing at the end of the worship, we'll say it again today, that, that when we share Christ's love with our neighbors, we do it so all lives are changed. So today I hope that in some way or the other, uh, your life has changed. I hope, I hope some of those fears and anxieties get calmed down a little bit. I hope you experience peace. One of the things we do every week at the beginning of the service is we share that peace. Even when we're anxious, we believe somehow God can send peace through us to the people around us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so right now, for whatever reason you're watching, whatever you bought us here today, my first hope for you is peace. And the way we do it is simply like this. I say the peace of the Lord be with you always. You'll respond with also with you. And then we'll turn to our neighbors or type on the screen, peace be with you. And let God's peace flow through us to all the people around us. So may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Now take a moment to share God's peace with one another. Thank you, Janelle. And I've got a few more announcements I want to go through. First of all, on August 29th is Munchies and Movies. This is going to be in the Joy parking lot for a hot dog meal at 6 and a movie at 7.30. And you can register on the Joy website connect page. 
Also, a new small group is starting. It's a Zoom small group. It's going to go through the book Anxious for Nothing by Max Licato, which will be our sermon series in September. Now, this group will be held on Tuesday evenings from 6.30 to 8, beginning September 15th. So regardless of where you're located, you can participate in this group because it'll be all virtual using Zoom. So if you're newer to Joy, maybe this is your first time here and you don't even live in the area, it doesn't matter. You can join this group. Uh, and everything I just mentioned you can, be, can be found on our website on the Connect page. You can also go there to re request any prayer concerns that you'd like to, to give Joy staff or our prayer team to hold up. Please continue to stay connected by visiting that page often. And last but not least, if you feel called to give financially to help support Joy's ministries and the work we're doing in the world, go to the link on the screen and please give what you are able and what God nudges you to. We thank you and appreciate your generosity more than you can realize. And with that, we're going to welcome Mr. Tom up to the stage for the children's message. Kids, get in closer. Here comes Mr. Tom. Well, thank you very much, Pastor Mark. Good morning, boys and girls. This is a message on humility, and it's also a very special day in Gurnee because not far from here, the Association of Children's Message Givers is meeting, and they're going to announce the Children's Message Giver Award winner of the year. And, spoiler alert, I'm entered. I nominated myself because, in my humble opinion, why wouldn't I? So as we're waiting for them to come and, and call us with the announcement, I thought that I would mark this special day by singing a song that I've been playing the last few days. It's a very special message that very meaningful to us and to me. And I'd like to share it with you now. It goes like this. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be some kind of a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. I'm doing the best that I can. You know, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, you may think that I would win this contest because of that talent alone. And I was really surprised that there wasn't a talent portion of the contest. They said they were judging on some other stuff that I was just too busy to look about. So, but if I had been in that contest, I would have not played the guitar and sang, even though I am amazing. I would have done the other talent that I have, which is juggling. And you may not know it, but I probably am the best juggler in Gurney. And I thought that this morning I would just give you a little taste. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Whoa, whoa. Hey, I don't think those tennis balls were regulation weight. Oh, oh my phone's ringing. I had it on vibrate because, after all, we are in church. Hello, this is Tom, and on this special day, how could I make your day even better? Oh, you're from the Association of Children's Message Givers. Yes, and you've just announced the winner, and you were told to call me first? Great. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I didn't win, and you said that the main thing for the winner was to be humble, and you didn't think that someone who nominated themselves was very humble. Hmm. Oh, okay, 
I understand. You've got to call the winner now. I understand. No, I don't have Sherry Sato's phone number. Goodbye. <sighs> Kids, I need a minute with God. Oh, Lord, I guess it is hard for me to be humble. I was so focused on me and what I could do that I lost the focus that all my gifts and talents are supposed to be for you. Help me to be better at focusing on how I can humbly serve you and what you want in the world and help the kids that are watching now to know that they don't have to be perfect. They don't have to try to brag to their friends that we all just need to know that you love us as we are and we just need to keep doing the best that we can. And all God's children said, Amen. See you next time. Thank you, Tom. That was great. That was great. Hey, uh, we're going to carry on in a moment with that theme of humility. But since we're starting off a new sermon series, why don't we start with a brand new question? Now, here's the question I'm going to ask you. How well do you wait? How well do you wait? I'm not talking about waiting on tables. I'm talking about just waiting. Like on a scale of 1 to 10, let's say 1 is you're like the worst waiter in the world and you're, you're the most impatient, and 10, you could wait for every, anything. Are, are you a 1 or a 10 or somewhere in between? Let me tell you this. I am a terrible waiter. I'm terrible at waiting. I'm probably a 2. My wife thought I was a 1. I'm just terrible at waiting. When she was pregnant with our kids... I was terrible waiting for those nine months. I was like, is there any way we could speed this up? Uh, I love having Amazon Prime now. You know why? Because you don't have to wait. If you order something on Amazon Prime, it shows up the next day. I love Amazon Prime. How are you when it comes to waiting? Now, for me, the worst time I've ever had to wait is when I'm waiting in line, whether it's the grocery store or even amusement park like the slide you see right here. This is a shot of what it looks like in the line I had to wait on once with my daughter. We waited nine hours to go on an amusement park ride. I'm not good when I'm waiting in line. And, and part of my struggle is what I do is I tried to get out of the line because I'm terrible at waiting. So here's what I'll do. So, so I'm waiting in line with my daughter, Alyssa, in this nine-hour line. And, and I would, as her father graciously, say, hey, I'm gonna, how about if I go get us a snack? And then I will disappear out of the line and let her wait in the line because I don't like waiting. And, and then an hour or two later, I said, how about lunch? You look hungry. I'm going to go get us lunch. So then I went to get us lunch, and that was an hour wait there, and then I came back to her. Or, or we're going by maybe, maybe a gift shop, and I'll say, ooh, you do the waiting. You wait here. I'm going to go into the gift shop. I promise I'll be just back. Maybe I'll even buy you a souvenir. I think for me... The real problem when it comes to waiting is I don't know what to do when I wait. I just don't know what to do. Waiting is hard. And we've been waiting a lot lately, haven't we? I mean, waiting for things to go back to normal. Waiting to see how school is going to start. Uh, waiting in November for the polls to open and then the polls to close. Uh, waiting for a vaccine. Waiting for the economy to get better. My daughter was supposed to get married this year, and we postponed it till next June, and so now we're waiting again for her to get married. I know many of you are waiting for when we can get back to in-person worship, and not only in-person worship, but when we can get back to in-person worship without masks on. We are all waiting. I had to wait five months before I could hug my dad because he was in, he was in his assisted living home and he was on lockdown. We are all waiting on the world to change. And the question that we have to wrestle with the entire time is, what do we do while we wait? What do we do while we wait for this world we're living in to change? And for those of us who don't wait well like me, I, I've got good news for you. Our moment has arrived. God has something for us to do. For the people who just can't stand there and wait and have to do something. 
We don't have to just sit idly and wait for all these things to happen. With God's help, we can, listen to this, we can become a positive force in this world that helps change the very world we're waiting on to change. And that's what we're going to focus on for the next few weeks. How we can change the world that we're waiting on to change. So what we're going to do today, we're going to take some time to learn from Jesus, who in a mere three years changed the world more than any other historic figure. And and the foundation of the change he made started with his humility. Now, before I show you what he did to change the world, let's focus on what Jesus did not do to change the world. Jesus did not raise up an army to change the world. He he didn't uh, come up with a cure for a deadly disease like cancer. He didn't do that to change the world. While waiting for the world to change, he changed it by being humble. This, this, This virtue that is often seen as a weakness, Jesus raised up to a virtue. Listen to what Paul said, the Apostle Paul, when telling his church and now us what Christ meant and what humility looked like, the power of it. This is from Philippians. The book uh, of Philippians was written to the church of Philippi. Paul wrote this letter to them. He's telling the church, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in, listen to this word, humility, regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who... Though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, let's be honest. Jesus has had every reason to brag a little bit. He had every reason to be a little bit arrogant. I mean, he was someone who could walk on water. He, he could raise people from the dead. He miraculously healed people. And I'll tell you what, he changed water into wine, and boy, that would have been beneficial throughout COVID. Jesus had every reason to be full of himself. And yet, Paul reminds us that he emptied himself, and the only thing Jesus was full of was humility. Now, Jesus could have changed the world with a snap of his fingers. He could have did that and and turned all the hearts to him. He could have stopped war and everything going on in the world. But instead what he did, he came down here to model for us how humility will change the world. Now, to be fair, Jesus instituted a lot of change. Let's think about this. He, He told his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He gave us the great commandment, love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are two biggies. And and that was going to be a lot of world change when those took effect, but it wasn't going to happen overnight. And for that matter, it's been some 2,000 years, and we're still waiting on the world to change and adopt that. But Jesus didn't just like, like wait around and do nothing. As he was waiting on the world to change, he changed the world with humility by dying on a cross for us. He did that for us. He did not wait for someone else to start the change. He modeled it and he showed it to us. Maybe this explains why it is so hard for the world to change because we're hoping someone else will do the changing for us. I mean, maybe if we hire the the right politician or, or we hire the right pastor, they'll change the church. Or if we hire the right school superintendent, they'll make the right decision for how we open schools in the fall or whether we do everything virtually. If we just had the right person in place, they could make all the changes that we're waiting on. But with God's help, when we embrace humility, when we practice humility, when humility flows through us, When we embrace the very virtue that drove Jesus to the cross, I'll tell you what, it'll change the world. Okay, maybe it's not going to change the entire world, let's be honest about that. But I'll tell you what, when we embrace humility, it's going to change your part of the world. I guarantee it. It's going to change your home life. It's going to change your workplace. If if you're a boss, it's going to change how your employees relate to you and you relate to them. If you're a teacher and you practice humility, it's going to change how you relate to your students and your students relate to you. If you're a doctor, it's going to change how you relate to your patients and how your patients relate to you. And if you do it in your neighborhood, you're going to experience a sense of community that you've never had before. 
as we wait on the world to change, we change the world by being humble. Now again, if we know Jesus, we'll know what this world-changing humility looks like because he modeled it so well. Let's go back to that letter Paul wrote to the Philippians. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So, so how did Jesus demonstrate to the world this world-changing humility outside of literally dying on the cross? Well, first of all, it started at his birth. Think about this. The, when Jesus was conceived, he forfeited all the benefits of heaven. He sacrificed those. He surrendered those. He surrendered all the benefits of heaven to come down and be one of us, suffer like us, mourn like us, work like us, to be human like us. He forfeited that to come down and be with us. That was humility. And even though he was equal to God, he chose not to use that to his advantage. He showed us what humility looks like when he surrendered the benefits of heaven. But that's not all he did. When Jesus came down here, one of the things he did that he showed people that, that they couldn't just believe is he served others. He was a rabbi, a person in position, and one day sitting around the table with his disciples, he, he put a, a, a rag over his arm and he took a basin of water and he got down on his knees and he washed the feet of his disciples. And that may not seem like much today, although you may not like the idea of foot washing. At that time, the people who washed other people's feet were the lowest of the low. They were the servants. And Jesus said, let me show you, let me show you what it looks like to change the world. Serve others. Serve others for the sake of others. Lower yourself and serve others. He made it a point before he was crucified to wash the feet of his disciples. He surrendered the benefits of heaven. He served others. And because at that time, without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sins. I mean, back then, there was, it was just the way the religious practices were. You had to shed blood, like sacrifice some animal for sins to be forgiven. Because of that, in the greatest example of humility... Jesus suffered for our sins on the cross. His blood was shed for us. He, he surrendered his benefits. He taught us what serving was life, and he suffered on the cross. That was a model of humility. Even today at Joy, we get to practice some of that. We get to practice the serving part of that. Today, I'm hoping that people, lots of people, I'm, I'd be great if 50, 60, 75, 80 cars showed up with, with pots and pans and diapers and socks and brand new underwear, small detail, very important. And we showed up and we dropped those off and we could, we could flood some of our local organizations with, with, with this, with this uh, uh, generosity towards others. And all it takes is going to Walmart or Target and buying some things. But, but that in and of itself is modeling Jesus and changing the world while we wait for the world to change. To understand what it means for us to be humble, let's go back to that scripture one more time. He says, do nothing from selfish, selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. It's that last sentence that changed how I think about humility now. It actually blew my mind preparing today's message. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let me explain why this was kind of so mind-blowing to me. I've always believed part of being humble was self-deprecation. So, for example, if you came up to me on a Sunday in the rare occasion and said, Oh, Pastor Mark, that was a great message. That's just what I needed. I might respond as, No, 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 I'm not that good. Really, I'm not that good. Thank you, but I'm not that good. See, in that moment, what might sound like humility is really not. Because who am I talking about when I do that? Me. I'm bringing the attention back to me. See, humility is when someone says, you did a great job. You did a great job. And you just simply say, thank you. I thank God for everything, every gift I have. It's kind of like, it's, it's, it's admitting you don't have what you have, but giving God the credit for everything. Humility is not about putting yourself down. Humility is about raising others up. Humility is choosing to surrender what you can brag about and brag about others. Humility is serving others, and humility sometimes is suffering for the sake of others. My staff and I every year go to a leadership conference in August. This year it was virtually online. It was wonderful. 
And every year when they talk about leadership, every year when they talk about leadership, they talk about the virtues and attributes of a leader. And you want to know what one of the number one attributes are? Humility. The best leaders are humble. Good leaders, for the sake of others, take responsibility for their failures. They don't blame other people. When they do something wrong, they take, they, they, they just, they admit it. I messed up. And good leaders, for the sake of others, don't take the credit for team accomplishment. They give the credit to others. They give it. I mean, good leaders, if you want to find a good leader to follow, a humble leader, ask this question. Do, do they admit it? And do they get it? give it? Do they, they admit their failures? And, and do they give credit where credit is due? If they don't, that person is not a humble leader. Want to practice humility? I mean, like I said, you can surrender some of your benefits. You can serve and you can suffer for others. But you could also do this simply. Admit it when you're wrong and give credit where it's due. Think, think about families. Think about families. If, if parents, you just admitted to your kids, I was wrong. And give credit when they do something right. Even in the workplace. Could, could you imagine how this would change the workplace? If we simply admitted when we were wrong and gave others the credit. What do we do when we're waiting for the, for the world to change? Waiting on the world to change? We change the world through humility. You know why? Because humility inspires us. Stories about humility inspire us. We want to hear them again and again. We want to watch them in the movies because they inspire us. It, it makes us want to be a better person. I think one of the best movies that demonstrate humility is Forrest Gump. About the life and times of a very simple and successful man. Now, Forrest, you know if you saw the movie, he had a lot to brag about. But humility is one of his most compelling traits. Now, now listen to what Forrest Gump had bragging rights to. He, he met three presidents, was an all-American football player. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for getting shot in the butt talks, was featured on magazine covers, founded a thriving business, and even supposedly, at least in the movie, taught Elvis his infamous hip-swiveling, leg-shaking moves. Now, I would demonstrate that right now, but it might be a distraction from the message, so I'm just going to continue. And yet, what we will all remember about the movie was not just the famous line, life is just a box of chocolates, but his humility. See, humility inspires us and others to be better. Last part about humility. Do you want to know the bare minimum requirements for becoming a Christian? You want to know the bare minimum requirements for, for becoming a Christian, for becoming a disciple and follow Christ? It's not reading the Bible. It's not reciting the correct prayer. It's not even going to church. Just going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's not even tithing. Want to know what the bare minimum requirements for being a Christian? A God who humbled himself to the point of death for the sake of others. The opportunity for you and I even to be Christians and to follow Christ does not start with what we do, but what God humbly did on the cross. And the only plausible response to someone who surrendered, served, and suffered for us is the humility to admit it and the humility to receive it, the grace and forgiveness that God gives. See, in the Bible and throughout history, you know this. This is not a surprise. You know this. Even if you're not a Christian, you know this. What pride divided, humility united. And what pride and arrogance destroyed, humility restores. In our world, the world we're waiting on to change right now, our world reeling from a pandemic, our world divided among political lines, needs unity and restoration. And with God's help, while we wait on the world to change, we can change the world with humility. And that's all I've got to say about that. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, help us to see this today so crystal clear. You changed the world by being humble. You modeled it for us. Now, God. Inspire us, move us by the power of the Spirit that we talked about earlier. Just control our thoughts, our behaviors, and our actions. God, make us humble. Make us people who go out into the world and care about others, put the needs of others ahead of our own. 
willing to maybe surrender some of the bragging rights we have to raise up others. God, change us into humble people. Because God, your humility inspires us. And we live in a world that needs a little inspiration. And all God's people agreed and said, amen. table with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
After the meal, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink. This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to get whatever means you have for communion in your house. You can do that right now. Bread and crackers, wine and grape juice, you get to decide. I ask you to get that, and then in a moment, when I say the body of Christ broken for you, I'm going to invite you to eat whatever you bought. And when I say the blood of Christ shed for you, I'm going to invite you to drink whatever you have. And that's how we're going to share communion until we can all be in person again. But before we do that, why don't we say the prayer that we've always said and always will say, the perfect table grace. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, it's just a piece of bread and a few drops of wine, but it is saturated with the humility and the grace of your Son. God, please allow that grace and that humility to flow through us in the same way this bread and wine flows through us. Let it flow through us and from us into this world. God, when Jesus came down, he made a a lot of changes on how we should be and how we should act and serve one another. God, those changes are still taking place today. So God, let moments like this when we remember the grace and mercy you shared with us change us even further and faster in a world that so desperately needs it. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. my salvation savior of my soul send me out to the world to make you known jesus king of every nation this world's only hope send me out to the world to make you known send me out to the world I want to be your hands and feet. I want to be your voice every time I speak. I want to run to the ones in need. In the name of Jesus, I want to give my life away. All for your kingdom's sake. Shine a light in the darkest place. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Carry to the broken hearted mercy you have shown. Send me out to the world to make you known. To the ones in of rescue lead me I will go send me out to the world to make you known send me out to the world I want to be your hands and feet I want to be your voice every time I speak I want to run to the ones in need in the name of Jesus I want to give
give my life away all for your kingdom's sake shine a light in the darkest place in the name of jesus in the name of jesus here am i i will go send me out to make you known there is hope for every soul so send me out send me out here am i i will go send me out to make you known there is hope for every soul so send me out i want to be your hands and feet i want to be your voice every time i speak i want to run to the ones in need in the name of jesus i want to give my life away all for your kingdom's sake shine a light in the darkest place in the name of jesus in the name of Jesus. Repeat after me. Oh, one thing. My staff just alerted me that we lost the live stream early on. You may have missed some of the announcements. So please go to the Connect page, and you can hear everything and see everything that you might have missed during the live stream when it dropped. And with that, repeat after me. May we. Let's try that again. A lot of enthusiasm, man. Like, pretend like you're the entire congregation here. Ready? May we. May we. Reach our neighbors. Reach our neighbors. With Christ's love. With Christ's love. So all lives are changed. So all lives are changed. And all God's people agreed and said. Amen. Come back next week and join us for our live stream and the second week of Waiting on the World of the Changed. Take care, everybody.